What I'm going to do next is I'm going to ask uh, Jennifer Choi, who is the uh, of um, co-president of the UBC's UAM to actually introduce our next speaker. And should, to let people know, um, our UAM chapter here at the University of British Columbia, which stands for University Allied for Essential Medicines, is really, really well respected around the world. And as president, uh, vice president, maybe he's not going to be president, Vice President uh, Hepburn said this morning, uh, it was really the students that were really the driving force to some of the things that have happened with Neglected Global Diseases Initiative with global access and so on and so forth. So it's really important that uh, we embrace what the students are doing. So Jen, I'm going to ask you to uh, introduce our speaker, and let me just get this thing up and going while you while you do that. I'm even shorter than Keyshare. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Rachel Kittle Monroe, who is the president of the UAEM Board of Advisors. Um, before Rachel came to us in 2007, she traveled extensively with her work for MSF, and she's devoted her entire career to advocating for humanitarian issues. And as the president of our board, we are so, she's been such an overwhelming supportive factor in UAM and has really helped us grow here at UBC and also internationally. So, Rachel, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jen. That was very touching. Thanks very much. And I'm, I'm really proud to be here. I'm, first of all, I want to say how proud I am of all the students of Universities Allied for Essential Medicines. It really warmed my heart this morning to hear Vice President Hepburn and now again Kish reminding us of how some of these initiatives started at UBC. And UBC is one of the crowns, uh, one of the jewels in the crown, or actually, of UAEM, because it was one, is the first and only university in Canada to have adopted global access policies, uh, which you can find on the website, on the UILO uh, website. Um, we have now more of a movement uh, in the U.S. and starting to spread out uh, through a statement of principles and strategies that was adopted quite recently by Harvard, Boston, and various other universities, and which was endorsed by the Association of University Technology Managers. And any of you who are into licensing and so on at universities knows that that's a big deal. So the, university, the students have been very key in some of these movements. Um, so I wanted to say that first of all, and then secondly, I wanted to thank uh, the NGDI for inviting me to speak today on behalf of UAM, and particularly to Kish, who I had the pleasure of meeting a couple of years ago at the University of Toronto, and he completely inspired me to see here a scientist who was just so enthusiastic and so determined to actually make a difference and do something and adapt his working practices to do that. So it's really with great pleasure that I accepted the invitation to be here. And then I wanted to also thank the speaker before me because I was just so happy to hear about someone speaking about HIV AIDS. And just to talk, say a little anecdote of my sort of entry into really being concerned about access to medicines. In 1994, I was uh, unfortunate enough to be with MSF in Rwanda. And at that time, we took over our hospital in northeastern uh, Rwanda in the town of Ruangiri. And we took over our hospital that had been being run by the French military. And on the day that I arrived to run that, that mission, that project, I was taken around by the military guys and they showed me all the different departments, the pediatric, the internal, etc., and the surgery. And we thought, well, surgery is going to be our big focus. There were terrible injuries and also with the civil war that then was going on, we had a lot of gunshot wounds, etc. And then there was a door that was shut. And I said, oh, so what's behind that door? Oh, well, there's nothing much you can do about that door, about that room. So we went in and had a look, and it was just full of patients lying on beds, very near death, in a horrible horror. I've never seen such horror in one room. And what transpired, and what we believed, was that all those patients had HIV AIDS and were in terminal stages. But at that time, we didn't have a test, even to find out what those people had. We didn't have any drugs. I remember phoning up the headquarters and saying, what are we supposed to do? And they said, well, look, there's nothing we can do. Do you know how much it costs to treat one patient for AIDS? It was around about ten and a half, eleven thousand dollars $11,000 at that time. And the second thing I was told, you know, also is a lifelong disease. If you start caring for them now, what's going to happen after you leave? 
and the surf, you know, we're here for the emergency, etc. So that was what we were faced with. So we basically just had to do what we could to make their deaths comfortable. That image has stayed with me ever since. And when I think about neglected diseases, and I was very happy that Richard mentioned that AIDS is still a neglected disease in many senses. We, th we see how much those numbers are growing up. We see that people are needing to move on to different stages of treatment, yet many of those second stage, third, uh, third line, etc., treatments are not available in Africa or in many countries for the right kinds of prices. So I think in remembering, talking about neglected global diseases, we need to remember those diseases that are now in common parlance but are still people are not getting the treatment that they need, as well as talking about the diseases that have no market value and therefore even the drugs are not being developed for those diseases, which is then more the tropical diseases we talk of that we've been hearing about this morning. So I want to start a little bit talking about, if I could actually make it go forwards, there's that one, hang on. I'm a real computer. I would never be able to do this texting mobile thing in Kenya. I'm just just a button there. Thank you very much. Um, so why we've heard a little bit already. This, sorry, I'm a walker, so I may kind of go in and out of the zone of my microphone, but I'll try and keep vaguely still. I'll try and wave my arms instead. Um, so why, why we talk about access to medicines? Well, Denis already this morning addressed uh, some of those, those facts and figures. But I think just to pick up uh, one or two of them out of this slide, we see that one in three people don't have access to medicines. In, in sub-Saharan Africa, that rises to one in two. I mean, that's a huge amount. That means every second person in this room just doesn't have access to med the medicines that they need uh, for their health. And over 90% of those people that don't have access are living in, uh, have to cover up to 90% of their treatment costs, and they live in developing countries. So as was mentioned before, you know, this lovely idea of universal free ac access to free health care is something that we are very, very um, uh, fortunate to be able to benefit from, but that is not the majority of the world's population. And we see that essential drugs for people are either unaffordable, unavailable, or inappropriate. So I want to have a look at a little bit of those. I wanted also just to put this in perspective. The number of people that die every year is about 10 million people per year who die from neglected diseases. And that's 16 times the population of Vancouver. So that's a, that's a huge number of people every year that are not being uh, cared for. And these are about real people, real lives. As, again, you know, so nice in the, f the presentations we've had this morning from all of the three great speakers before me is that this is about people. So often we've gone into realms of discussion, you know, sort of intellectual property, you know, scientific molecules, da, da, da. And sometimes we've tended to forget that this is about people. This is a guy called Joseph, and have, uh, going on the theme of uh, Haiti from this morning, Joseph was somebody that was in the program of Partners in Health in Haiti. And the top left is how he came into the clinic suffering from TB, uh, HIV with associated TB. Once he was treated for his TB and he was put onto antiretrovirals, the picture six months later of him with his daughter is a sight for sore eyes. It makes you realize the power and the importance of what we can do with antiretroviral treatment and proper TB treatment. The fatal imbalance. I have to uh, do full disclosure. I've also done some work with uh, DNDI. So you'll see maybe a few of the phrases between Denis and I will, uh, will, will coalesce. And a fatal imbalance is very much uh, uh, the wording that we use uh, in DNDI um, about this issue. You see that over the past 30 years, global health has tr transformed at an unprecedented rate. It has increased incredibly with life expectancy increasing at an average of four months every year in the developed world. However, but for people living in developing countries, that's simply not the case, and they haven't benefited from that revolution. And so we have the millions who continue to die from preventable and treatable diseases. The poor and the forgotten. So what are those barriers to access? So one of the ones they want to deal with is the idea of affordability. The medicines are too expensive for developing countries and the people that are living there. And we look at what are the reasons for that 
uh, that barrier being in place. And one of the main reasons that has been seen is pharmaceutical patenting in developing countries. Um, before TRIPS, so I'm not going to go into a spiel on intellectual property, but many of you will be familiar with the term TRIPS, the trade-related intellectual property regime. But before that came into play in 1995, many countries, like developing countries like India and Brazil, didn't allow product patents on pharmaceuticals. Some of them had process, they allowed process patenting, but not the product patenting. But then, and they made that as a conscious policy decision that they should ensure that there was low-cost access because it would outweigh the potential negative impact that the lack of patents would have on innovation. So they, they really made that, that, decision make, that decision there. That was all overturned by TRIPS. So what TRIPS has basically said is that all countries by certain time frame have to have implemented patenting on uh, pharmaceutical products and so in India that came into play in the beginning of 2005 and we're still waiting to see the full uh, full uh, impacts of that with India having been sort of the pharmaceutical warehouse of the developing world for many many years with uh, good quality <coughs> drugs being uh, supplied MSF for instance was supplied around 85% of their drugs from uh, from the generic industry in India for our for our programs that's all going to change and it is slowly starting to change now The only way that you can get round those problems is by using the flexibilities inside that TRIPS agreement, so like compulsory licensing. And I want to make a, a mention of the Canadian uh, use of that exception later on. Um, and it has, what we've just seen is the, that it has uh, eroded uh, access to essential medicines internationally. Why is this an issue? Why are patents an issue? Why does it matter if there are patents? The problem is that when you have a patent, you create a monopoly, if you like. You, pre you pre reserve a right to the patent holder to be the sole person to produce, un produce that product under that patent. What we found over many, many years is that when there is competition, prices go down. I think this is a sort of fairly basic concept of the free market. And I feel very peculiar being the person to defend the free market because I'm, I'm sure you're all very sure I tend to head on the left-hand side of, of the political forum rather than the right-hand side. But anyway, here I've become a free marketeer and I believe in the power of competition because what does competition do? It brings down the prices. And the one main way that we've been able to ensure access to essential medicines in the developing world up until the real uh, that TRIPS has really come into play was through generic competition. If you look at that very famous little graph by now on the bottom left, up at the top, as I was saying when I first met uh, these, these people in Rwanda, it was around ten and a half, eleven thousand dollars per year to be treated on ARVs. Very soon after um, CIPLA um, introduced uh, their um, generic version, you go right down to less than $1,000 per year. And now we're down to like $99 per patient per year for a first-line treatment. So there's been a big dramatic change. However, if you look at that chart uh, up on the top right, you'll see there where you've moved from the first line to the second line, we're seeing another spike in the prices again, which is proving rather difficult to bring down. The other issue, apart from uh, the affordability, the, is the availability. We're talking very specifically at this conference about neglected diseases, and we've heard uh, that there are many diseases that simply either don't have cures or have cures that are so old or toxic that it's really practically inhumane to give people. I've seen people being given the sleeping sickness treatment, melasopol, through the intravenous, I wouldn't like to be the doctor, I'm not a doctor, I wouldn't like to be the doctor or the nurse having to give somebody that treatment. They call it uh, the, the fire that goes into the veins. It's extremely painful. It's extremely painful, and the fact that we're having to use that kind of treatment for people, I find absolutely horrendous in our day and age. So there are th so there's sort of different aspects of why people are not... Um, and uh, interestingly, most low-income countries are affected by at least five neglected diseases simultaneously. And as we've heard before, it tend it's always uh, the poor people who are the main victims of neglected disease for reasons that we've heard earlier today. And that major barrier to that innovation is the lack of market interest. And um, there's been a major lack of interest at the discovery level. And tr truth be told, that's been the case in universities up to, up to date as well. 
So again, we saw this earlier on, a very famous report that was done that really started to change uh, the whole discussion around the neglected diseases, um, showing that only 21 new drugs for neglected diseases had been produced between 1975 and 2004. So going on to the sort of the main part of what I'm here to talk about is where do the, where's the role of universities in all of this? Why are universities important? Surely it's all in the hands of the pharmaceutical companies or the generic companies and the problems with IP and et cetera, et cetera. Well, universities have a huge role to play. Uh, if we look at the, um, the United States Joint Economic Committee in 2000, who were looking at the drugs that had been produced in the U.S. over a, a period of time, the, of the 21 drugs that they found that had the greatest therapeutic impact, 15 were developed using publicly funded research, and most of which occurs at the universities. So that's a pretty big impact. Ashley Stevens, who's the current president of the Association uh, of University Technology Managers and is at Boston University, he, in a panel that we held in 2008, said that every single vaccine brought to market in the past 25 years has a contribution from university research. And on HIV, more than one-third of the HIV drugs introduced between 2002 and 2006 involve a university patent. There's also seems to be a shift, and there are some people in the room who know far more about this than me, so it would be an interesting discussion to have. But one of the things that's being uh, talked about much more is that universities are increasingly being seen by pharmaceutical companies as the best place to carry out discovery. Um, and there's some interesting data out there on the increased importance of licensing agreement to pharma sales. Um, again, I think it would be an interesting discussion to have, but they say that 26% of pharma sales by 2009 will come from licensing rather than from in-house R&D. So I think that there again it's showing this growing role that universities are going to be playing in, in being at that discovery stage. So these are some of the very well-known, for any of you involved in HIV AIDS, very well-known drugs that have come out of US and Canadian universities universities uh, to treat uh, the HIV AIDS. And in terms of the R&D landscape for neglected diseases, in 2005, universities were involved in 26 of the 63 existing neglected disease projects. So universities, again, are starting to take more of a role inside this area. It's not very many, 63 ND projects, but uh, universities have got nearly a half of those. Um, so, they, there's a, so through already significant role in drug R&D, the importance of universities in pharmaceutical discovery is projected to continue, um, especially with the growing importance of biologic drugs. And the vast majority of currently available biologic drugs were developed with significant uh, university participation. So there's a few examples there. And so we believe uh, that universities have a critical role to play in the future of pharmaceutical innovation. So where's universities allied for essential medicines? I think it's important just to talk a little bit about what this group is and, and where, its, where its successes have been and what it's hoping to do in the future. So the vision of the organisation, and I'll just read it, um, is that universities and public funded research institutions will be part of the solution to the access to medicines crisis by promoting medical innovation in the public interest and ensuring that all people, regardless of income, have access to essential medicines and other health-related technologies. So the mission of it has got three sort of main, main planks. One is to promote access to medicines for people by changing norms and practices around university patenting and licensing. Secondly is to ensure that universe, university medical research meets the, majority, meets the needs of the majority of the world's population. That's where it really where the neglected disease parts part, uh, fall in. And then the third part, which for me is a really critical part, is the empowerment of students to respond to the access and innovation crisis. I believe that, and as many of us do and know, it's that the students represent the future generation who are going to really um, take the advances of, that have been made in the past 10 years and really put those onto a, a, a new huge stage. So we need to get the kids coming out of universities excited, engaged, 
feeling empowered that they can make a difference. And I'm not talking just about students here in Canada and North America. We're talking about students in Brazil, students in India, students in China, students in South Africa, in Mali, in Ghana, etc., etc., going out. There are these young people out there with huge wealth and realm of idealism and capacity to do something. We need to give them the power to make a difference to their world. So where does the story of uh, UAIM start? I, I love this story because I think it's just just shows what the capacity is to do something. So we go back to 2001 when Stavudin, D4T, cost about 1,600 per patient per year. And as many of you know, that was a building block of the HIV AIDS treatment at that time before the combination therapies came in. And so Doctors Without Borders MSF in South Africa was scaling up its program and realized that they couldn't afford the price of this drug. So they went to Yale University because Yale held, held the patent and said, hey, do you think you could like sort something out so we could have it a bit cheaper? Because we've got like a lot of people in South Africa who are extremely sick and they're, actually they're all dying and we need access to this treatment. Could you help us? And yeah, I said, I'd love to help you guys, but you know what? It's nothing we can do. We licensed it. We gave an exclusive license to BMS. You have to go and see them. So MSF trotted off to see BMS or BMS. Sorry, no can do. Nothing we can do about it. So MSF was like, okay, now what do we do? And they just happened across this very bright, incredible student at Yale who said, well, this is not acceptable. I'm going to do something about this. So that student, Amy Kapsinski, um, who's now actually just returned to her alma mater, but she was at Berkeley for a while at Bolt Hall, um, she started a campaign. And she got, really got on the nerves of everybody at Yale and uh, until they just didn't want to see when she came anywhere near, they basically shut the door very tight. And then she did, made a breakthrough because she got in touch with the scientist who had been involved in the original discovery, Professor Prusov. And Prusov, when he heard what was happening to his discovery, was absolutely horrified. And so he decided to write an op-ed op -ed to the New York Times, which was duly published, in which he said, I, don't, I wanted my discovery to be available for all people rich or poor. And that created a huge change, a huge storm came out that BMS was not providing this and Yale was not doing anything. And they agreed to reduce the price dramatically of D4T, actually by 96% within a year. And it allowed MSF to really start the rollout of their AIDS treatment in South Africa and then across Africa. So that's a little bit the power that there is. And there's an <laughs> still rich on his cell phone. Turn it off, guy, texting. Um, <laughs> So, so that's where UAIM started. And from that, uh, from that starting point, you see obviously students in, uh, in the US and here at UBC actually got very excited about it and said, well, how can we be involved? Let's start. Why can't we do something? There's surely there's stuff coming out of Yara University that we can, we can start doing the same sort of thing for. So that leads to today. I think I didn't add these all up, but it's something like 70-odd universities now have very active uh, chapters of students, like here in BC. In Canada now, we have them in McGill. We have University de Montréal. Uh, we have Dalhousie. We have, uh, and then in the US, there's around about 50. Um, and now we just opened chapters in Brazil, so at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, Florianopolis, and uh, Recife. And we also have some very uh, early stage chapters coming out in Nigeria, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, and in Nepal. So we're just starting out on this phase of reaching out, and I find that a really exciting development. And I think particularly in this idea that Rich raised um, and sort of comes through the work of DNDI as well, is this idea of uh, innovation from the South and that we can start to look at people in the South and start to see what are they actually doing? How are they coping with these things? And how do we make sure that innovation and ideas coming from there are encouraged and are not stifled always by the ideas coming from the North, which are better funded and we seem to have more sort of access. Something is checking me. Should I just press don't send? Just making sure. Don't tell them about me. <laughs> Somebody's watching. Yeah, you. someone's watching. Turn the camera off. Yeah. Um, so that's a little bit uh, where we are today. And I think there's a, now the movement is also growing a lot in, the, in Europe as well, which is a very exciting uh, stage. So this has really all happened because when I started, I think we were at 49 in the US and three in Canada and one in the UK. So just to say in three years, it's really moved uh, very fast. So why should we act? 
Why should universities do anything? Why should students do anything? Well, there's a moral and, moral and ethical obligation. I think that's clear to us all here. And I think the really burning point is that university research is heavily funded by taxpayers. You know, I just sometimes at night, I just can't get over the irony of the fact I'm paying my taxes. That's going to someone to discover a drug. And then you get licensed to a company that then makes loads and loads of money off my little tax dollar. And then people are not getting access to the drug. So that's very simplistic. I understand that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but that is the simplistic way of looking at it, and there is an argument inside there. Of course, we need to deconstruct it and look around it, but it, that is the basic issue. Um, this was recognised by many universities. So in, I think the Stanford Nine Points was in, in mid-2004, like 2004, 2005, and they issued a, a thing called the Stanford Nine Points where these universities came together and recognized the issue of access to medicines, and they said that universities should strive to construct licensing arrangements in ways that ensure that those underprivileged populations have low or no-cost access to adequate quantities of these medical innovations, and they were referring to medical innovations from their institutions. Uh, UA made a consensus statement that we had signed uh, by various luminaries. Um, now I think it's up to 11 Nobel laureates have signed on, which basically set out these principles of how uh, universities should ensure that the fruits of their research were made available for the greater good. Um, that consensus statement sort of formed the basis of the, of the burgeoning UAIM movement. Stephen Lewis came and spoke at our um, UAIM uh, event in Berkeley in 2008, if I'm correct, 2009. And he is also a big supporter of what UAIM is doing and trying to help us out, particularly on the political level. So that political will part, Stephen, comes in there to help us. The World Health Organization has also, as many of you will know, have their seminars um, a uh, Commission on Intellectual Property and International Health report that came out in 2006. And in it, they state public research institutions and universities in developed countries should seriously consider initiatives designed to ensure that access to R&D outputs relevant to the health concerns of developing countries are facilitated through appropriate licensing policies and practices. This was then went into the strategy that was produced by this intergovernmental working group that came out of that report. And actually, one of you, the UAIM policies are actually can be found inside that plan of action. I mentioned earlier a very big moment uh, towards the end of last year when these six uh, universities, Harvard, Yale, Boston, Brown, Oregon, and Pennsylvania, uh, universities joined, uh, joined together to sign this statement of principles and strategies which commits schools to make vigorous efforts to promote global access to drugs through licensing strategies and we have meetings with the Harvard Technology Transfer Office every six months to see how they're doing on that. Um, so I have another meeting with them in a couple of weeks so I'm interested really I actually came and presented at our conference in Brazil and they're one of our biggest advocates of uh, global licensing now which is very intriguing and they've actually sent out some global access licenses to three of their partner companies that they're hoping we're going to exploit some of the discoveries that they've made and they're waiting to see what kind of feedback they get from those companies and how they feel about those policies being put inside there. So they're highly committed to that process. Also, the National Institutes of Health have now signed on to that statement of principles and strategies as well, which will give it a big boost. So we're hoping that more uh, universities are going to be signing on to that. So BC, I can't end a presentation standing in the University of BC without saying something about what UBC has done for global access licensing. So UBC is, the Canadi is a Canadian leader in the field of access to medicines, I believe. Um, and it has a global access policy, which you can all find online under the UILO website, um, which is basically broadening the societal impact of and global access to UBC technologies, requires that these concerns are addressed, i.e. Uh, broadening the social aspect, when a new UBC technologies are developed, patented and licensed. To this end, while applying the university's intellectual property policy, UBC will promote global access, prioritize environmentally friendly research, and at the end, this is our point, endeavor to ensure that underprivileged populations have act cost access to UBC research innovations through negotiated global access terms wherever possible. 
So now the next stage is to see that in practice, and Bob and I were just talking about that before, and there are clearly lots of initiatives going on inside UBC to get that uh, transferred through. And I just saw uh, Kishore and Co have made a very interesting article on that from March 2009. So the impact of global access licensing, which I hope we're going to see the results of here, is we saw from D4T it reduced it by 96% for that drug from $1,600 down to $55. And this was the human impact of global access licensing. And on that note, I say thank you very much. I just wanted to make a point that it's not just about medicine. Um, a family member of mine was a researcher at UBC and uh, refused to allow one of his discoveries to be patented in a way that was going to allow the private company to make sense of profit, it had agricultural implications. And then following that, he was criticized. Um, in terms of research assessment and grant use and so on, in that he hadn't been cooperative with the private industry. And when it comes to global health, medicine obviously is a critical point, but food and nutrition and all those other kinds of factors are, are critical too. So I'm, I'm glad to see that UBC is at least making policy that hopefully will avoid that kind of uh, behavior in the future. No, and I think, yeah, I mean, access to medicines is one aspect is such global health is huge and it comes at all different levels. I mean, we're looking about m mobile phone technologies, uh, you know, it's the whole range, it's everything really. So, what we're trying to, you know, I believe that it's a jigsaw and that everyone is a piece of that jigsaw puzzle and the best impact that we can have is taking our piece of the jigsaw and, and f going right through to the end of it because in that way we can keep focused and keep direction. But I agree and I think that, you know, that the idea that the policy that UBC is on is not just about medical technologies. Um, so, yeah. So I just want to mention I spent many years at the interface of biotechnology in the university and I think it was commented on earlier how biotechnology companies have not um, managed to leap to the fore in this area of providing drugs. And I think that people should appreciate that, that there's very real reason for that. Is they're controlled by individuals who have a lot of money and they want that money to get return on investment and they don't want anything to detract from that particular goal because <coughs> their, their intention is to put in a dollar and get the, some large numbers of dollars back. So, um, uh, on the other hand, in my own case, even though I've been building biotech companies, I feel that uh, nothing really detracts from um, neglected global disease use. But I think a really key point that should be made is that one of the reasons why UBC has been so open to changing its policy is because it thinks that you can still make a profit on a drug in developed countries, and that should be the driver to move the drugs forward to developing countries. And I think that even today that there's a massive gap that exists, not just in discovery but in development, in actually taking the product through preclinicals and clinical trials um, at a standard that is acceptable to, um, to our community, not just to the community that you're going to. Um, and I think that that has to be driven by making money eventually. So I think this is a very important point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'll be talking tomorrow. My, I'm Alan Salt from the Nevada Space Institute for Global Health. And I, like Robert, I've been in this thing from both sides. And uh, one of the sort of frustrating things we've had to deal with in the last few years is actually our inability to get, not even at the license stage, much earlier stage, to get hold of reagents to evaluate them without paying really quite large sums of money for something which is going to be for an affordable vaccine for impoverished communities. And I think one of the things is a degree of naivety on universities and public institutions, and I won't name them here, who, who really don't realize that by making these things available, it's the point Robert was making a few moments ago, they actually stand to gain money mm. because the, the ability to get the, there's a, there's a synergy there about getting the data for impoverished communities 
that can actually be used to make profit in, in first world communities. And I think it'd be interesting to talk, Rachel, later on about how we can perhaps make some uh, test cases mm. to um, so to educate the educate the tech transfer people. In. Yeah, because I think just to comment on that, I think that's where the biggest blocks have been is people, and it's about the metrics, right? We talked about this in the taxi this morning, but the metrics that people are using to judge their success. So while, you know, at the moment, the, the metrics that are being used is how many spin-off companies, how much is the profit, but all the other metrics are not being taken into account in terms of the human impact, the social impact, et cetera, et cetera. And how do we align that, that way of looking at it with the actual social mission of a university which is to do things in the interest of the public good. We all know that. That's my, why many people dedicate their life to academia, to science, etc. is because they want to help people do stuff that's good for society. So there's a, there is, and in our discussions with the technology transfer officers, there's often stopped, that conversation stops there because it's just like, well, I can't justify this. There's this idea that technology transfer offices are this source of huge income and the universities are going to be rich for the rest of their lives on it. But when you actually look at the reality, that's not, that's not the case. Lots of people here, oh. so uh, how, how should we go? Okay, so uh, back here next. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 yeah, go ahead. Um, Rachel, thank you for your talk. I was wondering if you could comment on the narrative of patents, especially at universities. Do you think patents uh, necessarily promote innovation, especially at universities? And if not, how can we make sure that innovators um, still get the merit of um, being the patent holder while having the innovation reach, um, reach the places that need to be reached in developing countries? Yeah, I'm not against patents per se. What I'm against is where it will cause the price of something to become out of the reach of someone who needs access to that medication. So I think at universities, you know, the idea of patenting, the, the issue is more in then the licensing. How are they licensed out? What can the university do to make sure that when that license goes out, if it's for a first world uh, country, or a developed nation, then, you know, the company can charge the price it needs to charge. But if it's going to developing countries and there's a, an application or a potential use in a developing country, there needs to be some exception put in. And that's the idea of the global access license and what was put through in the Statement of Principles and Strategies is that you can make that distinction. There should be something that universities put in to protect potential use in, in developing countries. Patents as a, oh, that's a minefield. Patents, whether they uh, encourage innovation or not, I think we could talk for a few days on that. Um, this, the, 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 the school is out on it, if you like. There's two, peop there's two schools of thought. One is that patents have not done anything to improve innovation at all, and there's statistics that seem to point to that. And then there's the other side that, yes, it does, because in the, in the mind... It is a way to ensure innovation, and it's the argument that's used all the time. I personally haven't seen how patents have increased innovation in the literature that I've read. Um, but again, it's, it's a, it's a two-way discussion. I think that innovation is, uh, is, is inspired by many different ways, and I don't think that patents are the, the, key, the key answer. Angus, uh, you're next, and then Denise. Yeah, so Seeing as I run the tech transfer office, I thought it'd just come into the facility. <laughs> <laughs> uh, UBC is a little bit exceptional. I just have to add that while you're here. <laughs> we've actually been changing our processes uh, over the last two or three years. And as we're assessing opportunities now, we're really looking not at a potential financial return, but a potential impact. And the impact could be a financial return, it could be economic, but it very much could be social as well. And we've also expanded uh, and are expanding our repertoire and toolbox of methods of getting things out. So we don't talk about tech transfer now, we talk about knowledge mobilization. And that can include as a channel patenting and licensing. Uh, that can include uh, open access, uh, open source licensing, knowledge repositories, knowledge translation activities as well. So we're looking at opportunities that are coming in and saying, what's the most appropriate channel that we can help move this through, which is going to get the largest impact? Mm -hmm. And the recognition of this from a budgetary point of view, we used to have our budget tied to the money we brought in. And this last year, the university has switched that. We no longer have a share of revenue. We have a fixed budget because the university has said, we want to see these broader impacts. 
and we know that if it's being solely driven by that revenue you bring in for sustainability of your operation, you'll chase the money. And by the way, I like money. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with making no, money for the really institution, <laughs> and it's actually very critical, as Bob points out, that we actually only have the ability to develop some of these medicines if they can go into commerce, they can go through the regulatory process. It's very risky, and it needs that motivation to make that happen. So our goal is how can we also piggyback on that activity to have the benefit to both a, a broader, uh, broader reach, particularly on a global basis. And in terms of uh, the access, uh, one of the things that we've done in the, the reagents and material transfers and things, you don't need them now if you're an academic and you want to go on academic to academic transfer. People complain about material transfer agreements. You don't need them now in UBC because we realize that's just an impediment to innovation. It's not in the neighbor of it. So there's been lots of changes in UBC in the last three or four years in this area. There's a lot more to go. Uh, but you know, we salute the, the work of UAM and the direction that you're propelling us. But it's very consistent with what we're, we're going in our directions now. Just need to spread spread that TTO evangelism. <laughs> so just two quick comments. The, the first one being, I'm fairly glad, I mean, to see the approach which is taken by UBC and other leading universities. But based on my experience at VNDI, I can still tell today that for us, it's even more difficult to work with most universities than with private companies. In most cases, I mean, universities are believing they are sitting on a huge safe of money on some ideas. And so basically, there are still a long road to, to go for basically the examples you provided to the, to today to be spread out throughout the world. So, I mean, it's a maybe a, a bit of a cautious note, but again, universities have a role to play, but this commitment to global health is not embedded in most of them right now. And my last comment regarding IP, I just don't know whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, as you mentioned, it could be a long discussion. Just as a joke, I can tell you in Geneva, WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization, is building right now a multi-story huge building. So it means it's not going to disappear from one day to the next. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, comments? Annalie. Well, thanks again, and congratulations on the wonderful team. I want to actually pick up on uh, the comment that Catherine had to be both uh, a researcher who was uh, tried to take a, an ethical position in terms of global access. Would you, assuming that that was a, considered a health uh, uh, you know, innovation, would would that researcher be able to go to the UAM chapter at the university and say, could you guys help? Is that, is that something that you would welcome? I, I think so. I mean, I, I, I believe that's one of the roles that the UAM students can do. And I think one of the things that we found to be really powerful is when there is a technology it does have applications for the developing world, and yet with, it seems that that availability is going to be compromised because of the policy at the university. That's exactly the kind of thing that we want to work on, and I think is really important. So I think that would be welcome. Sure. Yeah, no, great, great, great. Inspirational example that you're sharing. The question that I have. And going back to some of the things that, that Nigel was talking about when we started the day and we just started talking about impact, is greater drug development and, and shifting that balance is critical, as, as we've been discussing. But there are a number of strategies that can achieve impact that are complementary to that. So the question is, is UAM seeing the question of contributing to the impact of neglected diseases, which are also are a result of neglected health systems. Are they, as they shift more <coughs> towards looking at impact than purely the strategy of drug development? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, we have to remember UAIM sounds much bigger than it is. You know, I talked about the chapters. It re relies completely on volunteers. So we have, I think, two paid positions, and that is UAIM. Um, and it's really made up of very highly committed, very bright, some of the best uh, students around. Um, but they come in phases, they move on, you know, so there's, we have to be careful on how, on what kind of things that we're doing. 
because we have to be careful not to raise expectations that then our students are not able to meet to. And we're very much a grassroots organization and we want to stay that way. It's not meant to be from the top down. So we're always looking at how we need to re-evaluate re and redefine our, our mission. We've been very focused on global access licensing and there's been a certain success on that, although it's certainly not finished and there's a lot more to do. But the shift now is definitely to look more at neglected global diseases, to look at the development gap, to see what universities could be doing in that. And again, ideas and discussions and thoughts about what we could be doing and where students could be most effective are very well. So it's a, it's a constantly evolving organization. Jen? Um, in addition to uh, promoting, I think, global access to other universities, and, and um, especially considering the way UBC, the direction UBC is going, um, I think we also need to convince the federal government. I think people in this audience who write grants always have to fill out that part about benefits to Canada. And so your comment about taxpayer dollars seems to be interpreted as impacting only Canadians' health as opposed to global health. And I know in some cases when people didn't take that section seriously, they didn't actually get their grant funded for that reason. Yeah, and I said that I wanted to mention something about the Canadian access to medicines regime, and I think that it's not about funding, but it's a very much in the same vein. You know, we have this, Canada was the first country to try and use one of the flexibilities in TRIPS, the August 31st decision, which would allow us to export drugs from Canada for a developing country. For those who don't know, that's not actually allowed by TRIPS. You're only allowed to use compulsory licensing, this where the government comes in and basically says, well, we don't care what the patent holder says. We believe that there's a public interest in this, and therefore we will allow a generic company to produce a low-cost version of this drug. Normally, you can only do that within your country. You can't do that for export. So this exception allows it for export, and Canada introduced a Canadian access to medicines regime known as the Jean Chrétien Pledge to Africa at some point. And um, I was actually very involved in that because we basically worked with a generic company, Appletex, in Canada to try and produce a drug and get that for export. Under the regime, it took us four years to get one drug out to Rwanda, which looked after 20,000 people. It was great for those 20,000 people who would get access to the treatment for two years, but the company said they'll never do it again because it was so long and difficult and expensive, and I certainly wouldn't go through that process again when I know I can just write a fax to an Indian company and say, hey, can you just give me that drug, please? And they say, yeah, sure, here's the price, and it will be there on that date, and it's about, you know, sort of six months or something, um, or even less. So now we're trying to go through a, a reform of that legislation to improve it, to try and deal with the issues that came up in practice of trying to use it. The resistance from the, at the federal level is massive, and they're trying to delay it. It's, you know, if it doesn't get read by the committee before the 1st of November, it will just be sent back to the House, which basically means it will be, it will be gone, it will be forgotten, and we have to start all over again. And that's like another three years of work thrown in the ditch. And there's just very little, it's extremely difficult to get the interest around that, despite massive amounts of work doing it. And I think on the funding, it's the same thing. I spent four months walking around the corridors of the Canadian government trying to get up a little bit of money from Canada and as Denis and I talked about earlier I was trying to do that for DNDI and it's just like it's just nothing happening Canada hasn't contributed a single dollar to an organization like DNDI which I find really shameful um, so the commitment to global health at this moment in time in Canadian history leaves a lot to be desired well it has been better at moments, but Tomorrow you guys get your shot yeah. because <laughs> Peter Singer, who is the new CEO yeah. of Grand Challenges Canada, which by the way has 225 million, is that right Bob? I think it's 225, will be speaking tomorrow morning. It's my carrot to get you to come back on Sunday. <laughs> so you want to ask him the questions about Canadian government commitment to no neglected global diseases. The There's your shot tomorrow. <laughs> Second. We have Member of Parliament, Dr. Keith Martin, who's coming tomorrow uh, for closing remarks. Unfortunately, he's in, not in the party that's sitting in Parliament right now running the show, but, and he's committed to neglected global diseases. He's a politician. We should talk to him. So some of the things we're talking about here... Uh, we have our shot tomorrow, so uh, keep and, that in mind. And please ask, ask, I won't be here, but someone please ask Keith Martin why he won't support the reform of the Canadian Access to Medicines regime as such a great global health advocate.
So. Oh, Rachel, Please. I wish you were here. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Farah Shroff, and I teach here in the Faculty of Medicine. And I'm really enjoying your presentation and the discussion that's ensued because it points out some of the larger issues, I think, that, that universities face when we look at what really is the role of the university. On the one hand, there's the rhetoric, which you mentioned, which is that everybody's at the university, particularly faculty and staff, because we want to do good things in the world. And then in Canada, the tension that we've had increasingly over the past few decades is that government has funded less and less and less um, within universities, and we've gone to a larger, um, a larger role for a business model within the university. So in the 1960s and 70s, it was much easier to fund things within the university because they were being um, payroll by government. But right now, the university basically runs on the same old um, uh, talk of you have to publish or perish, and now you also have to have, have grants. So there's increasing pressure on faculty to keep this business model going. And at the same time, the university wants to help um, the globe. We've got international students who are coming here who are paying a lot more money than domestic students. And at the same time, we've also got domestic students paying a lot more in tuition fees. And what we've seen, and data has shown us this in the medical school and the dental school, is that that's giving us an increasingly higher number of elite students from a socioeconomic perspective. So the university is becoming, unfortunately, more of an elite institution rather than what we used to say, the vanguard of social change. So it really does raise some of the really larger issues for what is the university going to do for not just our country, but for the world. And there's a real big tension there because there's less dollars to do what we intentionally wanted to do. Uh, I should make one more, one more note. Uh, our, our president, President Toop, at the Board of Trade the other day actually mentioned NGDI UBC by name uh, at that meeting. And so I do feel that at the highest levels of this university, we are getting the dialogue that we're all seeking. I, I think now we hope to translate it into resources. Um, but just to let you know, we heard that the, where, I think so, right, Bob? I think we heard that the other day that our president, and another thing I will mention is President Toot will be going to the Welcome Trust in two weeks and NGDI is on his topic to discuss to the Welcome Trust. So I, I want people to know that at least at this university, uh, we're seeing things starting to happen. I hope it translates. Uh, we won't, really don't have any time for any more questions, but the dialogue is fantastic.